It's my great pleasure to present our today's speaker, Professor Lutsky from Pudermore. And uh, thank you very much, Professor Lutsky, for agreeing to deliver a lecture at our seminar. And please go ahead. Thank you. Yeah, thank you very much. And uh, first, I would like to thank the organizers for uh, their kind invitation. It's really a great pleasure to give a lecture here in the seminar. So the topic of my talk is weighted spaces of holomorphic functions with a special emphasis on Turplitz operators and Bergman projections. And this is a joint work with uh, Jose Bonnet from Valencia and Yari Taskinen from Helsinki. So let me start giving the basic definitions. So I stay entirely on the complex plane and I will be given an open subset of the complex plane and I consider the usual area Mute. measure, meaning just integration with respect to the real axis and integration with respect to the imaginary axis. In the, in the following, I mostly concentrate uh, for O on the open unit disk, but at first I want to uh, introduce the basic definitions for general O. Now this O will be, oh, come on, this O will be given a weight function V, which is nothing else than a continuous map mapping O into the positive real numbers. And this gives rise uh, for the introduction of the weighted LP norms. So for a suitably integrable function F, I, I define F norm of F sub VP for any P between one and infinity to be just the LP norm with respect to the measure V times dm. And the same for P equal to infinity. Here we take uh, for the norm, the essential soup of the product of modulus of F times uh, V of Z. And now we have the corresponding uh, weighted LP spaces consisting of all those measurable F such that the weighted LP norm is bounded. And most importantly, I concentrate on these subspaces uh, denoted by capital H uh, sub VP uh, consisting of all the holomorphic functions uh, satisfying this condition over here. Now for P equal to two, uh, and for a holomorphic function, uh, we have that always the evaluation map is bounded with respect to the weighted L2 norm. This is, of course, classical and standard. This follows from the properties of a holomorphic function. But here, now using the Ries representation theme for Hilbert spaces, we can express uh, this evaluation as scalar product. So there is a unique element in H sub V2 denoted in the following by K sub Z naught, such that the evaluation can be represented by the corresponding scalar product. And this means integration over O of H times K sub Z naught bar times V of Z dm of Z. And now uh, we Arrive, well, okay, I forget to give it a name, of, of uh, but this is, of course, well known. Uh, in the following, this K will be called the reproducing kernel. Now, uh, I introduce the Bergman projection for such a weight function. And this is nothing else than the orthogonal projection from L sub V2 down to capital H sub V2. And of course, this is a norm one projection, and it can be expressed by means of the reproducing kernel as an integral. So if we take any L sub V2 function, and if we take any point in O, then P sub V of G applied to Z naught is nothing else uh, than this integral over here. And in the following, sometimes I want to apply this Bergman projection to uh, elements which might not be in L sub V2. And then this here becomes the uh, def definition, the defining equation. So uh, I want to extend this definition uh, by means of this integral whenever this integral exists in the following. And now the next thing is to introduce uh, Turplitz operators for measurable f 
uh, called a symbol of the triplets operator in the following. And this is again, uh, if we apply the triplets operator to a given holomorphic function at a point Z0 in O, this is defined to be just the application of the Bergman projection to the product of F times H uh, of Z0. So again, we get this integral here, and this, when this, uh, whenever this integral is well defined, then we call it triplets operator. Now, uh, the topic of my talk is to give partial answers to the following questions. For example, for which symbol and for which weight is T sub F a bounded operator with respect to the weighted subnorm? So such that this integral exists and yields a holomorphic function. And we want this holomorphic function to be uh, to be bounded with respect to the weighted subnorm if we uh, plug in here again a holomorphic function which is bounded with respect to the weighted subnorm. So I want to give uh, boundedness con conditions in this respect. And moreover, and now here we have all the weighted LP norms coming into the play. So uh, the Bergman projection with respect to a weight V tilde might be even bounded for other piece between one and infinity, and maybe it might be bounded for other weights as well. And I want to uh, give a more or less complete answer for a special subclass of weights. Now let me start uh, with the open unit disk, and I would like to uh, specify the class of weights I'm going to consider. And this is again uh, quite classical. I want to consider weights which are essentially radial, uh, a weight on the open unit disk, and in the following I want to call it standard weight, if it is radial, meaning for any set in D, V of Z is the same as V of modulus Z. And moreover, if we restrict ourselves to the numbers between zero and one, uh, then it should be decreasing and on approaching the boundary, it should be zero. So in particular for the weighted subnorm, if we take a holomorphic function, which is uh, bounded with respect to the weighted subnorm, with respect to such a standard weight, this can mean that the holomorphic function itself is unbounded. However, the unboundedness then is controlled by one over V of Z. So let me give some of the popular examples for this. And here I just consider V of R for real numbers between one and zero and one. Uh, and via this definition, it can be extended to the full open unit disk. So for example, one over one minus logarithm of one minus R, this is certainly a standard weight satisfying these conditions here. And the most popular weights probably are these classical weights are one minus R to the gamma for a given parameter gamma. And uh, moreover, I want to consider exponential weights uh, defined to be exponent of minus alpha divided by one minus R to the beta for some fixed parameters alpha and beta. Now, for standard weights, one has a very explicit form of the reproducing kernels. It's very easy to see. So the reproducing kernel, after all, is a holomorphic function, and it can be represented by this Taylor series here, where we have Z0 bar. This is this Z0 down here, and we have these quotients uh, here, the corresponding moments with respect to the measure V of R, uh, D of R. So this is very easily established, of course. And now we see this uh, series has a converging measurement, meaning that as a holomorphic function, this reproducing kernel is even bounded with respect, um, is it, as a function is even bounded, and the evaluation map here is even a bounded linear functional with respect to the weighted subnorm. So it sits in the dual space of the Banach space S H sub V infinity, which is denoted by star in the following. Now, 
Let me come up with the first boundedness conditions for triplets operators with respect to the weighted soup norm. And this is just folklore, but it's worth to be mentioned. Namely, this is the following. We consider a standard weight on D and we consider a holomorphic symbol for the triplets operator. Then uh, we find that the triplets operator makes sense and is a bounded operator from H infinity V to H infinity V if and only if F is bounded. And this is quite easy to uh, prove. So let me just give the proof here. Uh, for example, if we start uh, assuming that F is a holomorphic function and is bounded, then for any H in H sub V infinity, we end up getting F times H again as element in H sub V infinity. And if we apply our integral or the, the Bergman projection to this product, nothing will change. It's the same as F, F times H. So, and the weighted soup norm of F times H can be estimated from above quite easily by the soup of all the moduli of F of Z and the weighted soup norm of H. And this means just by our definition, the triplets operator is bounded. And conversely, uh, if we now assume that T of F, T sub F makes sense and is bounded with respect to the weighted soup norm for a holomorphic symbol, then even the adjoint map is a bounded operator. And the adjoint map applied to the evaluation functional is nothing else than F of Z times the evaluation functional. And so we get, if we now, look at f of z modulus. This can be using this equation uh, expressed like this. Here we take the normalized functional and we go over and, and t sub f star applied to this is the functional. We apply the norm to this and we end up having just the norm of f of z. And since in the inner bracket we have a norm one element, this can be estimated from above by the operator norm of TF star. And since TF is bounded, the operator norm of TF star is the same as TF. And here we have again that the holomorphic function has to be bounded. So this is the first boundedness condition I want to present. And the next step is to go over to harmonic uh, symbols for triplets operators. However, here now we are in for a very big surprise because the situation in general for harmonic symbols is completely different. Actually, there exists a bounded harmonic function uh, on D such that the corresponding triplets operator never is bounded with respect to the weighted soup norm for any standard weight on D. And standard weight here, this is uh, the, a very important assumption for this theory. Now, uh, since uh, things can be made quite explicit, I want to give the idea of the proof here. And I can come up just with uh, the function which will does the trick. For example, if we take f of z, defined by this Fourier series, a set is running through the element of the open unit disk. Then, of course, we have a harmonic function. And if we check the boundary values, it's just pi over 2 and minus pi over 2. And this means this is really a bounded harmonic function. Now, uh, it's easy to see that uh, the corresponding triplets operator is well defined. And I want to apply this to the monomials z to the 4m, where m is running through all the integers. And here I take the norm of this monomial down here. So uh, we have a normalized element in capital H sub V infinity. Now, uh, before I go on, I would like to uh, explain this notation here. So if we consider the weighted subnorm of the nth monomial, 
then we have to study just the soup of this function here, r to the m of v of r. This is a continuous function. It can be extended to the number one by putting zero there. It's still continuous. It's non-negative, so it has to be bounded and it has to be points of absolute maximum. And I pick one uh, and call it r sub m. Uh, and so uh, here, uh, here I have uh, uh, to consider the norm of the monomial set to the 4M, which I put down here. And I want to apply the triplets operator to these uh, T of HMs. And first, let me note, of course, they are of norm one. And now it's very easy to see that these points of absolute maximum for the monomials, uh, 10 to 1 if m tends to infinity. Uh, this I will need in the following. Now, uh, I want to have an explicit representation for T sub f applied to hm by applying this explicit representation of the reproducing kernel. And after some calculation, we end up having the following Taylor series. So now we get, if we apply uh, T sub F, the, the F I was introducing here to HM at the point Z in the open unit disk, uh, we end up getting this Taylor series. So for the first 4M uh, summons, we have uh, alternating signs and here coefficients, which are not very interesting, but they should be non-negative. And here we have uh, the exponents 2J plus 1. And now for the remainder, we get uh, these coefficients here again with alternating signs. And here we have Z to the 2J plus 1. And down here again, the norm of our um, of our uh, monomial uh, set to the 4M. Now, the next step I want to do is to cancel all the summons with negative signs. And here I can use, of course, the standard trick. I go over to T sub F of HM applied to Z minus I times T sub F of HM applied to I times Z and dot with the factor one over two. And now uh, all the uh, summons with negative signs are thrown out. I end uh, up having here now the exponents uh, set to the 4j plus 1. And down here uh, I get this. And now this becomes clear. Uh, I was considering from the very beginning 4 times m because now it gets this nice form. And over here, again, I have set to the 4j plus 1 divided uh, again by this uh, uh, weighted soup norm. Now I want to uh, consider this function more or less at this point, r sub 4m, which is, of course, an element in the open unit disk. And uh, this yields the following estimate. So I start with uh, this here. This is R sub 4M divided by five times logarithm of one over one minus R sub 4M to the four. And I want to expand this logarithm into a series. Uh, then it becomes this series times this factor. Now the next thing is to put this R sub 4M over here and it becomes R sub 4M to the 4k plus 1. And then I put the 5 down here in the denominator and I uh, uh, um, estimate it from below, make it smaller, then the whole thing becomes smaller and it becomes this. And I add uh, at first sum end, the corresponding sum end where k is equal to 0. And now the only trick left is uh, to change the uh, summation index. I replace k by j minus m. And down here, if I replace this, I have these coefficients and they are exactly the coefficients, coefficients up here. And over here, I have to replace k by j minus m. And for the minus m, I put r to the 4m down here. And now I add 
V of R to the 4M, it was not there before. Uh, so in order to comp compensate for this, I put it in the numerator as well. Now look at this. It's exactly the remainder of the, this sequence for Z being equal to R sub 4M, with the exception that here we have to add uh, V of R sub 4M as additional factor. Now, if I add these summits here for this Z, I add only positive summits and I increase the whole thing again and I end up having this uh, as before at the point Z equal to R sub 4M times this factor here. And now this is easily seen to be estimated from above by the weighted soup norm of T sub F of HM. Now we started uh, from this left hand side and we know if M tends to infinity, R sub 4M tends to one. So the whole thing here tends to infinity. Necessarily this has to tend to infinity. On the other hand, in the inner bracket, we have a norm, we have norm one elements. And so this means uh, the triplets operator cannot be bounded. But this is all. Now, here it was quite essential that we uh, used uh, standard weights, so especially radial weights. If we uh, drop the radial radiality for our given weights, then this is no longer true. And I will give an example for this. And this is the only point where I consider other open subsets of C. If I go over to the upper half plane, meaning uh, consisting of all complex functions W such that the imaginary parts uh, of W are positive, uh, and I consider uh, a classical weight here, which would be just the imaginary parts of all the Ws to the gamma for some given positive gamma, then I can take any measurable and bound it F, and I end up having a, a bounded uh, operator, triplets operator T sub F bounded with respect to the weighted soup norm. The reason for this is that uh, one can come up with a very explicit representation for the reproducing kernels in connection with these weights here. And then this becomes just an evaluation of the defining integrals. And we end up having this in particular uh, this is true, of course, for bounded harmonic functions. Now, uh, I could use the Riemann um, mapping theorem and could transfer everything to the open unit disk, uh, but then I end up getting a weight which is no, no, not radial anymore. And so uh, this can happen even for non-radial weights on the open unit disk. Another variant of the theorem uh, two, three is the following. If I take uh, a trigonometric polynomial as symbol for the triplets operators, then the triplets operator becomes bounded, at least for an important subclass of the standard weights. I will come back to this in a minute. Now, uh, let me just introduce this important subclass, and this is quite known namely uh, the class of normal standard weights, um, which is something like the decay of V of R for R tending to one is not too slow and not too fast. And by decay, I mean, well, we, uh, we were assuming that V of R tends to zero, and this I want to denote by decay. Uh, and this should not be too slow and should not be too fast. And then we have a normal weight. Now let us look at the details here. There are certainly at least dozens of equivalent conditions defining normality in this context. And I prefer to give this definition here. So if we take, if we consider one minus one over two to the n and compare this uh, to one minus one over two to the n plus one, so the number down here is larger than the one up here. And V was supposed to be decreasing, meaning that this quotient is larger than or equal to one. And I want to keep it under control. 
So this means the decay should not be too fast. And in a way, this is the opposite. Here I uh, have a number which is larger than the one down here. So this quotient has to be smaller than or equal to one. And I want to have it properly smaller than one. So for some uh, fixed k after k steps uh, at the end. So meaning the weight should not be too slow. Now going back to our examples, uh, the logarithmic weight is not normal, it's too slow. This is definitely not satisfied, which is easily established. So the prototype for normal weights are uh, these weights, of course, but there are quite a few other normal weights. And the exponential weights are not normal either, they are too fast. Here for the normal weights we get this soup is infinity. Now, before I come back to triplets operators, let me digress a little uh, because uh, here the last two classes of weights, the normal weights and the exponential weights satisfy a more general condition and in a way are nice. And this I want to introduce as condition B for a given standard weight. I talk only about standard weights here in this context on the open unit disk. And this is the following very technical condition. So again, as before, we pick a point of absolute maximum of these functions here, but now M need not be an integer. And if there are more than one, just pick one. It doesn't make any difference. And now we consider these quotients here, where on top in the numerator, we have, fun we have the supremum of this function. And down here in the denominator, we have the value of this function is somewhere else at r sub m. So the quotient here has to be larger than or equal to one. And here uh, I take the corresponding quotient where just I uh, exchange n and m. Again, here I have the supremum of this function in the numerator and a function value somewhere else in the denominator. Again, this quotient has to be larger than or equal to one. Now the condition is the following. If I take a control number B1 by being larger than one, such that this quotient is smaller than or equal to B1, uh, I find a B2 uh, depending just on B1 and nothing else, such that the corresponding quotient here is smaller than or equal to B2, at least for the indices we are uh, which are sufficiently large apart and sufficiently large uh, far away from zero. So this is some kind of inner regularity. And this helps very much if the condition B is satisfied to analyze the weighted soup norm and to give uh, 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 suitable estimates. But it has uh, other meanings. So, for example, the following. Um, so after all, H V infinity is a Banach space, and it turns out it has as a Banach space only two isomorphism classes, namely, it can be isomorphic to little l infinity, meaning all the bounded sequences uh, with the soup norm. And this happens if and only if this inner regularity of B uh, is satisfied. And the other alternative is that H V infinity is isomorphic to the Hardy space H infinity, meaning just uh, all the holomorphic bounded functions on D with respect to the soup norm. So uh, if I may say so, the weight here is just the constant, the constant function one. And this happens if and only if V does not satisfy B. Now here, this is by far the nicest situation because for example, it means if H V infinity is a subspace of a corresponding superspace, we always end up finding a bounded projection from this superspace down to capital H V infinity because L infinity has this property and this is no longer true down here. 
Now, as I said before, the uh, normal weights and the exponential weights can be shown. They satisfy this. And here one has a, a relative easy um, admittance for estimates for the weighted subnorm, while uh, it's uh, it can be established that the logarithmic weight, which uh, I mentioned as example, does not satisfy this. And we are in this case here for the logarithmic weight. Now, let me return to uh, our triplets operators and let me now complete what I was already mentioning before. If we take a normal standard weight on D and if we take a trigonometric polynomial on D, which is after all uh, a bounded harmonic function two, then T of F, T sub F is bounded with respect to the weighted uh, subnorm. I do not want to say anything about the proof. Anyway, uh, somehow one has to consider a shift operator, the boundedness of a shift operator, and the boundedness of a triplets operator with radial symbols. And then one uh, can prove uh, this here. And so this gives rise to go over to triplets operators with radial uh, symbols. And this means just functions such that f of z is the same f as f of z modulus, like uh, in, like in, like the standard weights, for example. Now I want to satisfy this integrability condition, and this guarantees that the corresponding triplets operator, that the definition, this defining integral, makes sense. And now it becomes a bounded operator. With respect to the weighted subnorm, provided uh, we have this condition, for example, we should be a normal weight and we should have this boundary condition for F. Now, if R tends to one, this logarithm tends to infinity. So F of R then has to tend to zero, but in a relatively slow way, just logarithmically. Now, uh, as a special case for number one, one can uh, phrase number two. Uh, if we have a normal weight and f is a well-defined function even on number one, and as a function is differentiable there, when we then we don't need this anymore, uh, then uh, t sub f is already a bounded operator. Now for the exponential weight, uh, we have the following condition. Here we have to replace the logarithm by a factor modulus of one, uh, of one over one minus r to the one over two plus beta over four for this beta here. And it seems remarkable that, that we don't need the parameter alpha here in this condition. Now we can strengthen this a bit if we take uh, this condition to be equal to zero or this condition to be equal to zero, and then it becomes a compact operator. So T sub F is compact if V is normal and we have this strengthened condition here for the limit here and the same for the exponential weights. Now, uh, we have more general conditions for standard weights satisfying property B, but uh, they are a bit technical, and so I wanted to restrict myself to this more transparent conditions. Uh, I do not want to go into the proof here, but I want to give at least the main idea for the proof, and this is the following. Namely, uh, I uh, have the defining integral for the triplets operators and in uh, view of this, give, uh, this given integral condition for f, uh, this makes sense. It becomes a holomorphic function. And now we have to apply, we have to apply the triplets operator on such a function, say with this Taylor series here, which is bounded with respect to the weighted subnorm. So now it's very easy to see using this explicit representation of the um, reproducing kernel that we get T sub F of H applied to Z. This is this Taylor series here where we just have to plug in certain coefficients. 
And the coefficients look like this. Uh, we consider the two uh, k plus first moments. And here, oh yeah, uh, this is a misprint, sorry. Uh, now I see this. I was uh, looking at this uh, umpteenth times and I didn't see this. Of course, here the weight is missing. Here we should have the weight and down here we should have the weight, the given standard weight V. Okay. Uh, so we have to consider uh, boundedness of uh, multipliers. So T sub F becomes a multiplier here. Now we want to estimate the weighted subnorm of this holomorphic function. And by estimating these quotients here, and now we have one big difficulty because the monomials z to the k are by no means an unconditional basic sequence in the Banach space h sub v infinity. They are not even a basic, a shoulder basic sequence. And this can mean that small changes of gamma sub k produces huge changes uh, on the left hand side here. In order to overcome this problem, one can now use the properties of condition B and one ends up finding uh, that we can uh, divide this Taylor series here into blocks of geometric, uh, of, of consecutive blocks of, uh, of uh, geometric length such that some uh, neighboring blocks might be even overlap, but uh, otherwise they are disjoint in such a way that uh, the weighted subnorm of the element in one block, which is a polynomial, uh, is just a number, a fixed number, times uh, the subnorm of this polynomial on the boundary of the unit disk up to equivalence. And then the weighted subnorm over here uh, is equivalent to the soup of all these weighted subnorms of the blocks. Uh, and this is very technical, but very helpful. And uh, so it can produce, uh, for example, the preceding boundedness conditions. And um, sometimes we have to, uh, for picking out these blocks, one has to apply convolution with Dirichlet kernels. And uh, it's known that convolution with Dirichlet kernel goes to infinity as far uh, in connection with the subnorm goes to infinity with logarithm of n. And this might explain that we have to have this logarithmic factor over here. Now the same applies. Uh, we have uh, we can do similar estimates for the exponential weights, but this is very very long and involved. Okay, now let me just say a word about the proof of this number two here because this is easy and I can uh, using just standard arguments. So let me give the proof for number two. Here we have that F uh, is well defined even in one and it's differentiable there. So we can split F into F minus F of one plus F of one and then we can split the triplets operators accordingly. And uh, here we have a triplets operator with about with uh, constant symbol. And this is nothing else than F of one times the identity on H V infinity. And of course, this is bounded and we only have to look uh, after the boundedness of this triplets operator. And here we apply number one, which now has this form here. And of course, due to differentiability, uh, this is satisfied. And so we get uh, number two. OK, now let me go over to the second question. Namely, uh, uh, the boundedness of Bergman projections. And here we bring into the play all the weighted LP norms. And in the following, I want to restrict myself to exponential weights. Now let me recall. If we take a standard weight V tilde on D, then P sub V tilde is the orthogonal projection from L sub V tilde 2 to H sub V tilde 2. And um, 
we had this defining integral, which sometimes might even work, might even exist, uh, if uh, the element does not come from L sub uh, V tilde 2 and uh, might reproduce even a bounded function. So the question was, was under which, which condition uh, for different P, different P different from 2, uh, becomes P sub V tilde a bounded projection, and we might even uh, change the corresponding weight. And here we just concentrate on standard weights again. Now, let me give some results here. Uh, if we go back to the exponential weights, and of course, one would start settling this question at first, considering the case uh, V being equal to V tilde, and then there is nothing. So P sub V is bounded on L P sub V if and only if P is equal to 2. And then there, of course, as orthogonal projection, it becomes a norm 1 projection. Now, um, we have a consequence of theorem 2, 3, where we found a bounded harmonic function such that the triplets operator never was bounded. <laughs> And this means, in particular, that the corresponding Bergman projection here is unbounded on LV infinity for any standard weight. Okay, now, as I announced already, I would like to um, consider the class of exponential weights in the following way. I want to give myself a weight V with the parameters alpha and beta and a weight V tilde with the parameters alpha tilde and beta tilde. And I want to ask for boundedness in this context. <laughs> and actually we caught uh, as a source of inspiration, uh, we had two papers, one of Rossi and the other one of Konstantin Pelais. They gave a boundedness condition for the case beta equal to beta tilde, only alpha and alpha tilde are different here. And this is the following. So if we fix some p smaller than infinity, and if we look at the condition alpha tilde being equal to two times alpha divided by p, then we end up having a bounded projection from L p sub v to H p sub v for these v's and v tildes. And for p equal to infinity, we get this boundedness condition. So alpha tilde should be equal to two times alpha, and then we get p sub v tilde becomes a bounded projection on here. So uh, we wanted to uh, extend this. We wanted to, in this context, we wanted to give more boundedness conditions here. For example, if alpha tilde is larger than this one, so V tilde becomes more powerful in the sense it goes to zero faster. And we conjectured that then we would get a boundedness for the Bookman projection, but we failed. We couldn't do this. And we couldn't do this for the other way around for alpha tilde smaller than uh, this point here. And after a while, we ended up getting the following namely the preceding boundedness conditions are the only boundedness conditions in this context at all. Meaning if we consider the case as before, beta tilde being equal to beta, and alpha tilde is different from this two times alpha divided by P, then P sub V tilde is always unbounded on LP sub V. And the same for P uh, equal to infinity, if we take alpha tilde different from two times alpha, then P sub V tilde is always unbounded. And if we take the case P tilde different from, uh, I'm sorry, beta tilde different from beta, then P sub V tilde is uh, unbounded in any case. There is no uh, boundedness at all. Now, this seems to be a bit strange. And, uh, and well, I, I'm, uh, the proof is quite uh, technical and complicated, but I want to give you an idea why we just have at one point boundedness or at, 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 at all the other points unboundedness. And this is connected with uh, the uh, more or less technical 
uh, estimates. And I want to give an idea uh, for the case uh, number two, for uh, little p equal to infinity, uh, where alpha tilde is larger than alpha. And similar estimates can be made for all the remaining cases. So we consider the Bergman projection, the defining integral, and we apply this to these elements g sub k, uh, being e to the i k phi divided by v of r, uh, for all positive integers. This is a, certainly uh, an element of this Banach space and it has norm one. This is easily seen, of course. And now we want to uh, somehow estimate the um, corresponding weighted subnorm for the Bergman projection applied to G sub K. And after a lengthy calculation, one finds a lower estimate for this. And this is the following. Now we get that P sub V tilde applied to G sub K is, uh, has a lower bound um, consisting of these three integrals. Here we have the K plus first moment of the weight um, of the weight uh, V. So remember, uh, and here we have the uh, moment 2K plus 1 with respect to the weight uh, V tilde. Now remember, beta is the same as beta tilde. And here we have this moment with respect to the quotient of V tilde and V. And now uh, it boils down down to giving estimates for these integrals here. And again, after some lengthy estimates, we end up having this. So we get some universal constants, not depending on k, and then exponent of k, this is this k over here, to the beta divided by beta plus one. This is interesting in itself, uh, since it's an exponent which is smaller than one. And here this goes on and we get this product here. And we want to consider this as a function of alpha tilde. So we are in the case of weighted subnorms. Now, if we uh, plug in the boundedness condition, meaning alpha tilde being equal to two times alpha, this becomes zero. And uh, an analysis of this a simple function means that this boundedness condition is a point, is the only point of absolute minimum of this function, meaning outside this, uh, we always have positivity here, and then everything is easy. Then we can estimate uh, this norm by exponent of a positive coefficient times k to the something, and if k goes to infinity, this goes to infinity and this goes to infinity. But k, uh, the, in the inner bracket, this uh, g sub k was a norm one element. And this means p sub v tilde cannot be bounded. So if we plug in uh, this uh, point of absolute minimum, then we just get this estimate and this leads us to nowhere. This uh, is, uh, well, of no value at all. But here we know by the preceding theorem that P sub V tilde is bounded. And in all the other cases, we get similar functions of this type where we only have one point of absolute minimum. Now, let me just uh, summarize the whole thing. So we get for our exponential weights, here in the case beta to e, uh, beta equal to beta tilde, these the only boundedness conditions, and we have never boundedness for beta different from beta tilde. Now let me finish my talk, uh, going over to a variant. Instead of looking at the holomorphic functions, we could as well picked out have picked out the harmonic functions, which are denoted by small h sub vp, and we could define the Bergman projection as orthogonal projection from capital L sub v2 down to small h v2. And then we get exactly the same results as before. And the reason is the following. 
uh, if we take a harmonic function, it can be expanded into a Fourier series, and then we can apply the Ries projection, meaning cutting off all the sum ends with Fourier coefficients with negative indices. And by classical Bergman, uh, unweighted Bergman uh, spaces, one sees in the reflexive case, if little p is larger than one and smaller than infinity, the Ries projection is always bounded. But now, for p equal to infinity, we get the same. The Ries projection for exponential weights, and I talk again about exponential weights, again is bounded. Actually, we can show that boundedness of the Ries projection for standard weight in this context is an equivalent condition for condition B. And now, if we go over to p equal to 1, we get a similar situation as for p equal to infinity, we get two Banach space classes only, and we get again that the Ries projection is bounded. Hence, we end up uh, being able to express this HVP as some direct sum of two sum ends, which are copies of capital HVP. And then we can uh, study the application of the Bergman projection on each of these sum ends, and then we can use the preceding results to end up getting the same results in this context. Okay, my time is up. Thank you very much for your attention. It's time for questions. Is there any questions? Maybe I'll have one yes. more question. Okay. So basically, um, when you consider these general weights, you will not be able to calculate the kernel of yes. asset. asset. And yes. this com complicates very much. This complicates very much because if you have a concrete uh, kernel, then you can use the tools of uh, integral operators and estimates, etc. Yes. In this yes. case, I see that you doing kind of multiplier still, right? Yes, in one case, yes, yes. Yes, but can you can you can you state that you can provide us this sort of uh, multiplier theory? That means that you will characterize in some certain cases of case, of yes. course, you can characterize precisely the boundedness conditions, right? Or Yes, yes, of of course. I mean, um, what I mentioned there, this this multiplier multiplier thing, one can give conditions for boundedness of the of multipliers. Yeah, that's true. Yes, this is a kind of an integral condition. Yeah, but also, what about compactness? Uh, yes, I I think I uh, had just these two conditions about compactness, where we had these boundary conditions going to zero. And then we get compact operators. This was the only thing uh, I put down. And there are more uh, conditions of this kind for uh, for triplets operators being compact. This we have, yes. Also, Shatton class conditions. Uh, you mean, uh, oh, yes, OK, we, we just have these, these boundary conditions yielding uh, compact triplets operators in connection with uh, standard weights on the unit disk. But still, OK, OK, uh, one more question. But still, yes, of course. if you have a sort of representation of your operator in terms of multipliers, yes, probably, probably, I'm not saying that, I'm sure that probably it will be possible to have some integral representation with some sort of oh i see yeah journal. we didn't think about this uh, this will be maybe worthwhile to pursue yes yes well actually we were just i mean uh, attaching the theory of multipliers but essentially we were trying uh, to find boundedness conditions for triplets operators yeah, but, yes that's what i'm saying that if you have 
integral presentations and you can use tools of harmonic analysis of integral yes operations. yes yes and this this ideas were stated in our papers with some call i will send you this paper. yes yes uh, we'll this paper very grateful for, for this yes for your, yes for for classical case but mm -hmm. the idea is just generalization of classical projection and studies yes. Yeah. In multipliers studying the integral operators with certain uh, kernels, sort of mm -hmm. kernels. Yes, yes, this will be maybe an, another then way of. You can also um, study the separators on some non standard spaces like Gerder spaces when you yes. can, cannot use multipliers. You see? Yes, yes, yes. Okay, so yes. some papers of mine. Okay, this might be an interesting okay. way of Hans. going on. Yeah, yeah, I have a question. Yeah. Yes. Is there any investigation uh, that the reproducing kernel depends continuously in some reasonable sense on the weight? So you have weights with some parameters, and if yes. you have similar weights, you expect that the kernels will be very similar uh, in various ways. So, for example, if I fix an element uh, to the projection and I vary yes. the parameter, can is, is has such a thing been controlled or investigated? Oh, uh, yeah, well, okay, in our estimates, these parameters show up and one can um, maybe, um, well, I, I, okay, uh, so for our um, estimates, I mean, we have... That, uh, I might ask you for a projection, uh, you get only an imprecise information about my parameters, you're doing the projection with, with the slightly wrong parameters, and I would expect that you should be able to show that you get something reasonable. <laughs> but uh, I'm going ask, ask more of this. Such a thing has been uh, discussed already in the literature. Uh, well, okay. What I was going to say, I mean, for our estimates, we, we get functions uh, uh, depending on the parameters, which are continuous functions. But I don't know if something comes out of this. Maybe this is an idea to uh, pursue. Yeah. yeah okay. <laughs> yes. Okay. Thank you for the okay. suggestion. Okay. Okay. So, Professor Rosenblum, please go ahead. Okay. You. Thank you. Uh, thank you for a very interesting talk. So, my question is the following: You have found uh, several interesting situations when the uh, Bergman projection is not uh, bounded in. Uh, uh, certain spaces. There yeah. is a natural question there. So uh, when the projection is not bounded to separate the class of symbols for which the uh, corresponding tuplet separator is still bounded. So probably this class of symbols would yeah. uh, involve uh, some conditions uh, of uh, having uh, this or that kind of zero at the boundary. Yes, uh, but I think it's an, an interesting question. Yes, yes. I, I mean, it can happen that, um, well, in, in, uh, that the Bergman projection on a subspace of the corresponding uh, space LP is bounded, uh, although it's it's unbounded on the full space. This can happen, yeah. So that the corresponding triplets operator for some symbols is bounded, but the Bergman projection is unbounded. Of course, this can happen. And yes, it would be interesting to relate the two questions in this context. Yes, you're right. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Well, maybe some more questions. Well, we actually had very nice discussion here. Okay. Professor Luski, do, do you have connection, do you have contacts of Anait Arutunyan? Yes, yes, I do. Yes, I just met her today. <laughs> say, say hello to her. And say, say to her that I'm in the area one now. Yes, yes, thank you. Yes, yes, I will do this. Okay, very nice. Thank you. If there are no more questions, then let us send our speaker for very nice presentation. Yeah. Thank, thank you. you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you for a very nice lecture. Thank you. And okay. see you in two weeks.